This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on the year-end edition of Transit Unplugged, the world's leading transit executive podcast. This is a special one-hour review of what happened in 2022 across the world in public transportation and a fresh look at 2023 from some of the industry's top leaders, led off by the Secretary General of UITP, Mohamed Mezgani. Mohammed takes us behind the scenes of what's happening at UITP, the world's largest transit organization, representing well over 1,200 transit agencies and, and associations around the world. Joining him will be Jeremy Yap, who called in from Singapore in the middle of the night his time. Jeremy is deputy CEO of LTA, Public Transport Policy and Planning, which is the transit agency in Singapore, and they are a cutting edge transit agency. He talks to us as well about what's happening there and around the world, some trends. Uh, as also, we're joined by Rod Jones, portfolio leader and head of Medaxo Americas, one of the world's largest transit technology companies and the sponsor of our Transit Unplugged podcast. That's in part one of this special year-end review for 2022. In part two, we have an interview with Julie Tim, who is CEO of Sound Transit in Seattle, Washington, here in the United States. She takes us behind the scenes of her tour this year, moving from Richmond, Virginia, where she headed up a large transit agency there, to Seattle, where she heads up an agency with one of the largest, if not the largest, capital budget in America. She talks about all the things that they're doing there, including the continuing push for equity and inclusion, which has become a very top trend in public transportation. We're joined also by Rod Jones, who then stays with us for part three of the podcast. We pull back the curtain behind Transit Unplugged and explain to you some of the changes that have happened over the last year and take a look at what we see happening, the trends in 2023 when it comes to technology, which is largely behind what's driving public transportation's Coming out of the COVID pandemic into the new year with a great vision uh, and verve and hope for the future. All that on this special year-end edition of Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Thank you so much for being with us on this journey as we now are in our sixth season, talking to transit executives around the world, using thought leadership to guide the way from one part of the world to the other. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort. Great to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged, in-depth this week with some very special guests as we take a 2022 year-end review and a look into what the future of 2023 holds for the public transportation industry. We couldn't have pulled together, I don't think, a better panel than the folks we have on today's show, starting off with Mohamed Mezgani who is the Secretary General of UITP, the International Transportation Union. Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you very much, Paul, for inviting me to join this yeah. podcast. It's great to have you. And Jeremy Yap, who uh, is Deputy CEO of LTA for Public Transport Policy and Planning in Singapore and Vice President of UITP. Thank you so much, Jeremy, and a good friend of the podcast. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. Great to be on Transit Unplugged. Yes, we've done several events before, and uh, your transit system there is phenomenal. I can't wait to hopefully have the chance to visit it sometime soon. Thank you. You're so kind. Yes. And then, of course, Rod Jones, who is portfolio leader and head of Medaxo Americas, who is the sponsor of this podcast. Rod, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast today. No, Thank you, Paul. I'm happy to be here. Yep. So we were just talking before in the green room. Uh, we also have Julie Tim joining us, uh, and she is the CEO of Sound Transit. And uh, so good to have her. She's going to be recorded separately, but will be part of the overall podcast today. Uh, she came from Richmond and has been a good friend of the program as well, just starting with Seattle Sound Transit earlier this year. So, Mohammed, we were mentioning that we were going to uh, try to take a, a global view, and the folks on the uh, on the podcast today are from all around the globe. You've got me near Washington D.C., Rod's in Seattle, Jeremy's in Singapore, uh, and you're over there. And tell us where you're calling in from, and tell us a little bit about uh, UITP before we get too far in depth here. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I am currently in the UITP office in Brussels, Benjo. So everyone has left the office. I'm the only one now. It's seven, uh, seven p.m. You know, and uh, and it's great to to talk to you. So UITP is uh, is the International Association of Public Transport, and it was established here in Brussels in 1885. So it's the oldest association based in Belgium, actually, and wow. it gathers the uh, public transport stakeholders, so the transit operators, 
the regulators, uh, authorities, the, the supplying industry, researchers, consultants, etc. So the whole ecosystem, I would say, of, of public transport, uh, we and covering all modes. I mean, the mass transit modes, rail and bus and water transport, but also the new mobility uh, solutions, car sharing, uh, ride hailing, scooter sharing, bike sharing, etc. It covers uh, more or less 1,900 or 2,000 members in 100 countries. Yes, it's a great association. Uh, You you guys do amazing work, and I'm so happy to have been a part of some of those events in the past. Earlier this year, we were able to film an episode of Transit Unplugged TV while in Dubai at the the UITP MENA conference, which I think was the first big in-person event you all had sponsored since the COVID pandemic. Exactly. Yeah, it was our first event, and this year we were lucky. We had the three main events, Dubai, Karlsruhe in Germany, and Singapore. Yes. Yes, that was. Uh, I heard that was great. I'm sorry I missed that. Speaking of Singapore, Jeremy, let's bring you into the conversation. Tell us a little about yourself and your organization. Uh, well, Paul, we are public transport authority uh, in Singapore. We are about uh, well close to almost seven thousand in in strength. We don't operate, but we basically regulate the public transport services. We we also uh, build the, the the system and develop the transport system here in Singapore. And we're very strong in uh, trying to ensure that public transport remains the backbone in Singapore. And so under the mantra, a walk, cycle, a ride, we promote, uh, you know, trips that are public transport in nature, which, which are shared and which are, which are also active in nature. So uh, that's what we do here in Singapore. And tell us about your role with UITP. Yeah, so in UITP, I'm the vice president, uh, leading a, the division for the organizing authorities, which means, you know, the uh, you know the members which are public transport authorities in UITP. Very good. Well, thank you for joining us, Jeremy. Uh, I asked you on this show because I really believe that your agency, LTA, has some of the most cutting edge, leading edge transit innovations and doing it right. Uh, more than um, almost any other transit system I'm aware of in the world. So can't wait to hear you tell us about some of the great new innovations that you've done this year that I've that I know some about, and probably some I don't know about. So uh, and then finally, Rod Jones. Rod, you are um, uh, my boss, <laughs> and also uh, uh, the head of Medaxo Americas. Which uh, Medaxo is the uh, well. I'll let you tell it. Tell us a little about yourself and a little bit about uh, where you work. Well, uh, thanks, Paul. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short here, but I'll say first on the Medaxo side, uh, I, I lead the Americas business, a group of businesses or portfolio uh, that canvases Canada and U.S. Uh, and uh, Mexico and South America. Uh, we have approaching almost 1,200 team members across all of our businesses. Uh, a little bit of a plug for Medaxo globally here. We, we you know, to tie it to Mohammed's uh, comment earlier, we do business in over 35 uh, countries. We have 2,400. Uh, approaching 2,500 employees on a global basis, thir- 19 brands, uh, I think 37 offices and counting. Uh, you know, we, we're highly acquisitive and we also invest heavily in, in organic growth. So um, we have an insatiable appetite for bringing on new team members. So whatever number I give you today is is probably going to be obsolete uh, by tomorrow. But uh, on a personal side, I, I'm based here in uh, Seattle. Uh, but uh, I probably spend as much time in the airport these days as I do in my own home. Uh, and uh, most of my team is spread out all over uh, the Americas, to be literally uh, speaking, but born and raised in Detroit. So my roots are in the Midwest of the U.S. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us. And um, thank you, Medaxo, for continuing to sponsor this program with really no expectations, just as a thought leadership program to promote public transportation around the world. It's wonderful. Speaking of public transportation around the world, Mohammed, we've had quite a year, haven't we? 2022 is the year we came out of the pandemic globally. And I know that, you know, uh, COVID's still around some, but most governments have announced that, you know, we're officially out of the pandemic uh, earlier this year. And we started to see ridership come back. We started to see in-person meetings again, like we mentioned, and a lot of good things. Why don't you give us a roundup of what you see that has happened in 2022, some of the highlights uh, from your perspective as head of the International Transit Association? You said we uh, we came out of the pandemic, but actually public transport is still under the impact of... of yeah, that's cool. true. That's right. Yep. Uh, so uh, ridership, yeah, ridership is growing. It's in average, it's, uh, it's uh, still below the 2019 levels. 
we could say between 60 and 90 percent according to to regions and, and and cities it looks like Americas are behind other regions of the world in the, in the recovery when we, we, we compare uh, with other regions. But so the main reason of this, uh, of this recovery, which is behind, uh, still, still not at 100%, is work from home in many cities. And, and this is having impact on, on public transport use. Also the growth in using cars, I must say. Uh, but what's good is that uh, during weekends, we see that ridership is much higher. Uh, it's exceeding hundred um, uh, percent in, in in some cities. So the recovery is exceeding hundred percent in some cities, and it shows also that people feel feel safe now using public transport. So this is one one important, let's say, aspect I, I wanted to mention. But also, you know, this year we we have this uh, this war in Ukraine, and many countries are impacted by the consequence of of, of the war and and. Uh, and public transport in many countries is, is impacted, and especially with an increase in uh, of operating costs due to the increase of uh, of energy and energy prices, but also other uh, other services and, and products, and and this increase of energy prices is not uh, only for fossil fuels, but also for electricity as well. And in many countries, the prices of electricity are indexed on gas uh, and and fuel and uh, oil prices. So uh, this is impacting a lot public transport operations. But at the same time, also, we see that public transport revenues are also at risk. Um, in many countries, we see authorities and governments are imposing low or, or free, uh, free fare public transport. Uh, we see it a lot in Europe, I must say. Germany, with this very emblematic uh, Nine euro uh, ticket per per month, uh, but also in Spain, in Luxembourg, where they introduced free public transport. In Malta, also in Europe, they introduced free public transport, and and we when we see the the, the impact of these measures, uh, we can't uh, we don't see really very positive results in terms of modal shift from cars to to transit, uh, and also when we look at the at the figures commuting. Commuting trips are not growing significantly when we introduce this uh, free or low fare public transport. So, so at the end, we have costs which are growing for public transport and revenues which are which are at risk. So, it's really a, a challenge for 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 public transport uh, stakeholders. And I would say, you know, when we want to attract people on public transport. Uh, we need more supply, we need more investments, we need more capacity, more exclusive lanes, more frequent services, and not necessarily a lower fare. So first, we have to make sure that we have the, the enough public transport, that we have more public transport. And then if we have that, and we have a better quality, it will encourage people to leave their cars to use, to use public transport. And let me conclude with the with one important challenge, another one, you know, uh, that, that is you know, significantly impacting public transport is the shortage of staff and, and, and skills in public. And this is a global trend. We observe it on all continents. Of course, in some continents, is more a shortage of drivers or uh, mechanic agents, technicians. Uh, but we see also more and more a difficulty to hire people with the new skills, you know, related to digitalization, to IT, to automation, because the sector is competing with, uh, with other industries to attract these talents. So it shows that we need to build a strong brand as employer uh, in, the, in the public transport industry. That's a very good summary. Thank you, Mohammed. What a, what a great uh, review. It's... Uh... It's uh, cautious optimism, and I can't wait to hear what you have to say when we come back around and ask you where you think we're headed for this new year. But let me switch over to Jeremy. Jeremy, you've had quite a few um, big innovations occur uh, at your operation, even in even during the midst of the pandemic and coming out of it. Tell us some about some of the the great things happening at LTA. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, I I felt that Mohammed provided a good uh, overview of of some of the challenges that hit. Uh, the authorities in different cities for us uh, trying to put, uh, you know, the transit system here in Singapore, keeping it running during the pandemic. Uh, we are fortunate to be able to weather some of the hard 
uh, winds of the pandemic. So in, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the new lines, our sixth metro line that we launched. Uh, it was uh, due to open in five stages. So we basically kept on track. Uh, so in 2020, during the height of the pandemic, we, we we launched the first stage, which was three stations. And then in 2021, during the difficult uh, period of the pandemic, we, we launched six stations. And then very shortly this year in November, we launched 11 stations, which, uh, you know, is quite significant because this line goes from the north of Singapore, quite near uh, where we meet our neighbors, Malaysia, uh, the southern part of Malaysia and Johor. Uh, right down to Gardens by the Bay. If you've been to Singapore, that's our Bay Area. Uh, and uh, that's right in the heart of the, the new downtown, as it were. So we are very glad to be able to push forward uh, in the midst of, you know, what Mohammed talked about, the challenges with high interest rates, uh, high energy uh, prices, uh, falling ridership due to the pandemic still recovering. Uh, and scarcity of resources in terms of, you know, workers and, and, and stuff. So uh, it's been a, you know, whirlwind of a year, but uh, I'm glad to say that we've come out, uh, you know, fighting, uh, and trying to make, make it work. So, you know, so, so it was gratifying to be able to launch the line. I call it 1111 because on the 11th of November, you know, we opened, uh, the ceremony for the line and it's 11 stations. Yeah, so so uh, it's a testament to the hard work and industry, uh, not just LTA, but the entire ecosystem here in Singapore. And uh, and also, we, as Muhammad had pointed out, we also managed to have uh, the first uh, regional conference here in Singapore for public transport, uh, Singapore International uh, Transport uh, Congress and Exhibition, SITCE 2022. Yeah, so uh, there was a great addition, you know, a great exhibition, a great turnout in terms of the participation. So we're happy to end the year strong, uh, uh, both, uh, you know, in recovering ridership and also in, in making the, the whole uh, industry come together uh, to celebrate uh, in person this time in three dimensions, seeing each other yes. in three dimensions. <laughs> of course, with a hybrid uh, uh, possibility, but mostly uh, we're there in person. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. I think... Um to to also offer some perspective from what's happening here in the in the western side of the world we have seen uh unprecedented investment from the federal governments of countries like the US and Canada into public transportation to help pull us out of the uh the ravages of the pandemic and really we are positioned i think going into 2023 well in, in the sense that even with supply chain issues etc there's been a lot of capital investment like you talked about jeremy uh in london of course they had the elizabeth line open up i just interviewed mike bagshaw from mtr who was operating that and talked about you know pulling that all together there at the end of the year um, and there's been a lot of investment around the world, Rod, in technology. Uh, technology is really what empowers public transportation now in the twenty, in this twenty uh, twenty two going into twenty twenty three. And although I like to say, you know, a lot of transit systems are still stuck in the nineties with their with their technology. It seems like yeah. many of them have invested in technology. What are you seeing uh, as you give your year end review from the technology side? Yeah, I think that's well said. I'm gonna. I'm- before I answer that question, I do want to kind of speak to uh, Jeremy and Mohammed's uh, comments around uh, trends because we're seeing the same thing. I think you know this all too well. And uh, Paul, with between uh, labor constraints and obviously the energy uh, crisis that we're navigating our way through, uh, the one thing that, that I think is interesting, and, and every city seems to have a slightly different narrative around a common theme, uh, and that is ridership has recovered somewhat since COVID. But we're still seeing uh, the, the demographics of those riders uh, having changed quite a bit. So a lot of uh, what we refer to as essential workers now, uh, you know, riding many of these lines as opposed to, um, and I'll speak for Seattle's uh, case, where we had a heavy population of uh, urban commuters coming into the city centers to work. Well, now all that remote work is taking place. It's a change, right? Uh, and so a lot of our uh, transit agencies across the U.S. are uh, responding to that in different ways. Uh, so I, I think the, you know, tying it back to your comment about technology, we're seeing more requests for projects where we allow more dynamic uh, route changes, if you will. Uh, we may have paired transit uh, and fixed route bus service actually getting uh, mixed together in a hybrid uh, format. And so kind of the theme that I would highlight here is really just 
how do we respond to the changing marketplace, the changing environment that our, uh, our, our customers are operating in? And most notably, and this is probably the most acute challenge, right, is labor shortage, right? We've got projects that we're uh, involved in right now, major contracts that we won that we're trying to get it deployed and de deploy the innovation quickly. But unfortunately, our, the agencies are struggling to get the projects completed uh, because they have labor shortage. Right. So it, it is really, really a, a protracted uh, challenge. But short answer is we're, we're trying to you know, structure our business in a way and, 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 and investing in new products, investing in acquisitions that help us develop, develop and deliver new capabilities to our customer uh, while the marketplace is, is the marketplace is changing in real time. So it's, it's a challenging issue. Yes. But, Mohammed, as we head into 2023, we've really got the antidote to lockdowns, right? Which is mobility. That's what I've been telling people. We are the providers of mobility in the city. I mean, we're positioned to really, I think, take our place next to other, um, you know, essential services like medical, educational, parks. Transit now is no longer seen in many cities as an also ran. It's now seen as, hey, during the peak of the pandemic, like Rod just said, it was those essential workers that were riding our transit system. If it wasn't for the wheels and the bus that go round and round, the wheels of our economy might have fallen off. What say you? And that's what makes me, uh, uh, keeps me optimistic, actually. There you go, yeah. And, and I think, you know, this COVID uh, crisis um, has shown clearly the essential role of public transport mm. and, and, and the essential role of, of those workers in, working in public transport. And so you said earlier that investment is still uh, is growing uh, in, in public transport, and that's right. You know, despite the crisis, despite the, the this all this questioning, the the cities and county they keep investing in public transport, and and because uh, because it's the the only way to fight climate change is the only way to make our cities more accessible. Uh, make them more healthy, more uh, uh, pleasant, and, and uh, places where people love to live. And if we want really to to decarbonize mobility, you know, we have no other choice than having public transport part of the solution, together with walking, cycling, and shared mobility. And you know, we were at COP twenty seven in in Egypt uh, recently, and we saw how public transport was on the agenda, which was not the case last year at COP where ah. the focus was on electrification, on technologies. This year, public transport was on the agenda with very uh, promising initiatives launched by, uh, by COP, by the Egyptian government who was uh, uh, hosting uh, the COP. I think now the trend is in favor of public transport and sustainable mobility, and also citizens are calling for that. We see a number of, of cities where citizens, they want this pedestrianization of, of, uh, of the center and how you can easily integrate this with uh, with uh, clean mobility uh, mobility services and public transport is one of them so yes indeed it's it's uh, it's as i said when i started uh, it's what keeps me optimistic that's good uh, jeremy what do you see coming in 2023 not only for your uh, system there in singapore but also you know as vice president of uitp uh, of the organizing authorities what do you see coming for us what trends do you see coming for us in 2023 yeah uh you know, they are quite similar in thoughts as Mohammed. Uh, we are coming out, uh, we are in endemic phase. A lot of the recovery is still happening in ridership. So I think we need to be innovative, uh, not just having tech or the technology stack enabling us, whether it's, uh, you know, in the use of AI and all that to do less with more, uh, to do more with less, but, uh, but we also need to policy innovate. And I think that's important and, and be ready to try and pivot and try different things because we need to adapt the, the, the supply to the demand and also to shape the demand. Yeah. So, uh, as far as uh, we're concerned, we, we continue to invest in public transport, but we also need to be smart about making it sustainable, which was what uh, Mohammed was talking about earlier. So, uh, I, I think the, the capacity to policy innovate on, on, on the way we, uh, move people and the way we structure our schemes and prices and ticketing. I think these are, these are areas in which we can keep the system going. Uh, you know, so, so, uh, the other thing I like to point out is that we are also, 
uh, as Muhammad said, uh, going into a season where coming out of the pandemic, but uh, right into the climate change challenges of extreme weather. Uh, we've seen it all over the world. Uh, Singapore is not spared. In, in that sense, we've seen very excessive rainfall. So, so it's having to keep the system resilient, and that takes uh, investment as well. So it's not just building the new infrastructure, but the existing brownfield uh, structures need to be kept resilient from some of these uh, more extreme weathers because you, you surely, surely don't want uh, your public transport metro to, which is the backbone of your city, to be underwater and under uh, the elements. So, so this is part of the thinking uh, that keeps uh, the transit system moving and strong in, in the cities. That's great. So if I hear the summary from both of you right, I think we're talking about uh, sustainable public transport as a trend going into 2023, uh, what I call environmental stewardship and the important role of public transportation in our overall stewardship of our environment. And that, of course, includes zero emission buses, which isn't just electric anymore. Uh, a big up and coming technology now is hydrogen. Uh, hearing about it all over the world, my friend John Rassant um, just was over there in Monaco with a big event there. And I'm sure some of you all were there from UITP as well. The return of riders, but maybe in a different fashion, right? Maybe we reach out to new riders who haven't tried public transport before because they're coming in nights and weekends and, and seeing the cities, whereas the hybrid work schedules are creating a, a three day city for many cities across the world where people are going in Tuesdays through Thursdays. Uh, and then recruitment of employees and retention of employees is a big one in order to make that happen. Uh, I've talked to numerous CEOs who told me, I've got great plans from Ireland to Denver. They've told me, we've got all these great plans, but we don't have enough drivers to implement the new routes that we've worked on to make sure they're meeting the needs now. So we, uh, we've got to come up with new strategies, and there are lots of them on the market now. Of course, microtransit coming on strong, and also public transportation being used as a way to promote equity and inclusion in our cities. Rod, what are you seeing on the technology side when it comes to 2023? Yeah, I think everything that, that that we've been talking about for the last few minutes all uh, has a touch point for us. I mean, if, if I look at some of the uh, investments that we've begun to make in 2022 that we will continue to make uh, in 2023 around software development, uh, speaks to micromobility solutions. It speaks to um, you know safety uh, oriented solutions. By the way, I mean I'm gonna speak very generically. I can't get into all the details, obviously, right. but uh, but another, I think an important trend here is that. Um, that uh, I think we're touching on here is that with the labor shortage, uh, as you know, it's probably going to be protracted, by the way, whether you're talking about bus drivers or technicians, uh, what we expect to see, though, is that for those who are leaving the workforce, aging out of the workforce and retiring, they're being replaced by younger workers who are who've grown up in the iPhone generation. Right. So all of a sudden, our software solutions need to look and feel a little differently and behave more similarly to to smartphones. Right. So as a result of that, we're starting to see more requests for app development. Uh, we're looking for we're upgrading UI uh, uh, user interfaces in our, our software as well. So there's a lot of innovation around around that front. Uh, so uh, AI, uh, as Jeremy uh, mentioned, is another uh, use case here that we have uh, we're starting to incorporate in our products. So a lot of a lot of investment. Another piece, too, um, is that we will continue in 2023 to be as active as ever on the uh, mergers and acquisition side, right? Because we see a lot of opportunity to accelerate our, our innovation by acquiring businesses that, have our, that are further along in that, in that uh, process. And so uh, the good news for us here is when interest rates go up and, and uh, capital becomes harder to come by, we're in a better position uh, to buy businesses as, an, as a very active acquirer. So, uh, so 2023 will be a busy year for us, no, certainly. Speaking of busy in 2023, Mohammed, uh, UITP has a, a busy agenda of events and all kinds of uh, exciting things coming up. And the big one I wanted to focus on was Barcelona. Tell us what we can look forward to in Barcelona this year. Oh, I mean, we, uh, we are impatient to be in Barcelona. <laughs> yes. in June, from the 4th to the 7th of June, please save your, the date in your calendars. Uh, so Barcelona is the Global Public Transport Summit. It's an event that we organized for the first time in 1886 in Berlin. And, you know, it, it goes every two years to a different location. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to cancel the 21, 21 uh, edition. And now we will be back in Barcelona after Stockholm in 2019. 
So it will be the largest event uh, uh, ever uh, we ever organized in uh, in uh, in UITP. Of course, it will cover you know the topics we have been talking about uh, and the challenges that public transport and mobility and cities are are facing in the field of mobility. So uh, we'll have a big exhibition, uh, forty thousand square meter uh, of exhibition with the latest technologies. Um, Hydrogen buses, electric buses, you know, uh, ticketing systems, information systems, etc. Maintenance, predictive maintenance, etc. So, and we will have, uh, we expect uh, uh, about fifteen thousand visitors per day there in Barcelona, coming from all over the world. Uh, so yes, it, it's uh, it's and the number of side events. There will be also the awards ceremony uh, where we will hand over the public transport awards. Uh, and and the number of other uh, uh, important uh, events uh, and uh, yeah i look forward to to seeing you there and to welcoming everyone there in barcelona can't wait to be there what do you think about that jeremy yeah we are absolutely excited to uh, you know return to the global summit uh, even though we didn't stop the the regional conferences and we did well as mohammed said earlier you know the global summit well from stockholm we had a, a bit of a hiatus because we couldn't hold it in melbourne and now returning to Barcelona is just absolutely great. I think the industry is bouncing. There's great optimism in coming together to knowledge share and and to build up and encourage and affirm one another. And I think uh, there's no better place uh, than the Global Submit. Yeah, so really looking forward to it. Very good. Well, um, I'm hoping Rod and I will be there as well as many other people from our company. And we're looking forward to participating again this year like we did uh, several years ago in Stockholm. Uh, Jeremy, Mohammed, Rod, thank you so much for joining us today as we took a look back at 2022 for our industry and the bright future, which is, Mohammed, I love the theme for your conference. Uh, share with us what that what that theme is going to be. Yes, I should have said that earlier. You're right. Thank you very much, Paul. Bright light of the city. Bright light of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's public transport who brings light to the city. You know, that's our that's our theme. And, and come and discover how we are going to to illustrate this theme in, 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 in Barcelona. Yes, very good. And Mohammed, I wanted to mention to you that I met your uh, the new head of North America, Jasper Singh, just recently and think he's a wonderful, uh, wonderful new leader for the North American market here for your organization. Again, Happy thank you all. That. Yes. Uh, thank you all for being with us. This is going to be a great year for public transit 2023 is, and I can't wait to work with you to make it even better. Thank you again. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to part one of this special look back at 2022 and look ahead to 2023 with our special guests, Rod Jones, Jeremy Yap, and Mohamed Mezgani. Now stay tuned for part two of this special episode with Rod and Paul talking with Julie Tim, CEO of Sound Transit in Seattle. This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged. Today, we have a look into the future and a look at the past from two of our nation's leaders in public transportation, Julie Tim, who is CEO of Sound Transit in Seattle, and Rod Jones, who is portfolio leader and head of Madaxo Americas. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Rod's here. Rod's my boss, and he's going to play co-host with me today on the show. Uh, Julie, you and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, you, you started, um, I think I had some interaction with you when you were in Nashville, and then when you went to Richmond, and now you've moved across the country to one of the nation's great transit systems, one of the largest capital budget transit systems, Sound Transit. Uh, quite, a, uh, quite a big move for you. And of course, you're in Seattle now, and Rod, that's where you're at, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and and quite frankly, that was one of the things that I wanted to lead up with. I know, uh, Julie, uh, you've been here only a few months. You, you timed your move shortly after our beautiful summer weather uh, here in, in Seattle. I'm, I'm curious as to what the first few months have been for you, uh, both personally and professionally. Well, I'd say the weather here is beautiful all the time. You, you can't convince me otherwise. Uh, right. Even with the rain, even with the snow, it's been it's been beautiful here. I, I can't I can't say enough how much I've enjoyed the move. Going from the East Coast to the West Coast, is a, it's, a, it's a pretty big culture change. Uh, we have a West Coast is Pacific Northwest. We have a, a little bit of a Pacific Northwest nice, a little passive aggressive. 
everyone here stops at the crosswalks and waits for the little man before you cross. Um, <laughs> huge culture shock. Yep. <laughs> I'm not used to that. But it's, it has been a very different move going from East to West and going from a mid-size, a small mid-size agency to the largest construction, expansion, transit project in the nation. It certainly has been eye-opening. The difference in what the prairies are and how we're doing our funding and how the structure of the staff is and the support of the community. It's a very different community and political environment as well. Julie, I know that uh, one of the passions of your heart is uh, equity and inclusion. Uh, Mm -hmm. You were one of the uh, anchor chapters in my book on that topic. Uh, Talk to us about, are you bringing that same passion to you to sound with you to sound transit? Are you focused on that there as well? I absolutely am. Now, we've had three major referendums here for the construction of light rail, BRT, the expansion of the Sounder commuter rail, um, the express buses. The first one was back in 1996. I'm probably that wrong. It was about $4 billion. Then again in 2009, it was about $17, $18 million. And then in 2016, that was $54 billion. We're eventually building 112 miles of light rail uh, by the time we're done. And that's great. That is awesome. I mean, really jaw dropping. But if we can't operate it so that the riders feel like they're, it's clean and it's safe and it's secure, if they don't understand the wayfinding, if they don't understand how to pay or where to pay, if they don't feel like they're being taken care of, why are we building? So that's my goal for 2023. Every day that I've been here, um, well, that's not true. I, there's, I, I got sick, so I didn't ride transit then. But for the most part, I have used my cart maybe four times since I've been here in the past three months. I use transit. I walk. Um, I bought an e-bike. Uh, I use the sidewalks. I'll use scooters. I use the trains, the light rail to get everywhere, even if it means going the two-hour trip down to Fife, which is the south, or the two-hour trip to Everett to the north if I have meetings. I'll get up at 6 a.m. We'll get up at 5 a.m. I'll leave at 6 a.m. for the house, take the two-hour commute. I use transit the whole way, and I've been tweeting about it as well, what works and what doesn't. The operators, when they're amazing, and the sidewalks, when I trip and break my phone. And yeah, that happened. I wasn't paying attention because I was tweeting my experience. So yes, (laughs) but it is about the rider experience here. Uh, When we're we're doing the maintenance to try and get ready for the the massive expansion we're going to have in the next few years, the system needs some upgrades. It's starting to age. And that means we're having some shutdowns and we're having some bus bridges and it's painful for our, for our riders to experience that. So when I see that, I am out with them. I'm experiencing it with them. I'm tweeting it with them and I'm responding to them in real time, what they're experiencing. And it's informing what the 2023 plan is going to be for me to get operations, maintenance, safety, security, cleaning, fare ambassadors, passenger ambassadors, really primed in 2023. So when we start opening the major extensions in 24, 25, 26, we're ready. You know, Julie, to that point around, uh, you know, sharing the experiences, learning it real time, getting customer feedback and the like, I thought it was interesting to to read in the, the local media. Obviously, I pay attention to it since I live here. Um, to see all of the uh, public, I was going to say public hearings, but I think they were just public list, listening sessions. That have been taking place over the last couple of days, going from one community to the next to get feedback on the planned expansion. Uh, what what have you been learning uh, so far from that uh, that process? So the I think probably the ones you're talking about are for the Chinatown International District in particular, but also for the Ballard area, which is a little bit north yeah. of here. It's it's interesting that it's not just interesting; it's inspiring to see the commitment that not only Sound Transit, but the board and the entire region has to being equitable, reversing some of the strategic impacts that have happened, or sorry, um, the institutional and the long-term impacts that have happened to many of our communities over the past decades. There have been the I-5 quarter when it came through impacted the Chinatown International District. Uh, Originally, that district was closer to the water. It got pushed out. Uh, when World War II came out and the impacts to the Japanese American populations there. When the Chinese Americans were originally here, they weren't granted citizenship and they were put to the side. All of those things over the past decades and generations have built up so that this community has been impacted over and over again. 
Now, light rail is going to come through. And the plan was to give a new station that would have a lot of economic benefit to that community. And originally, I think that there was some consensus maybe around it was before my time. But when the reality starts coming closer and they start seeing that businesses actually will have to get buildings and businesses torn down to put that in place at the very gateway of their community, they started to raise concerns about, is this yet one more time when their, in, their community is going to be impacted and see the negative impacts of construction without having that, you know, that benefit? So we're doing a, a pause on a multi-billion dollar planning process and construction wow. process to really look at what's the right station configuration and alignment in that community or adjacent to the community to protect that community. And that's what you're seeing in the papers now is a true commitment towards equity and making sure that we get these generational investments right while we're planning them and before they're constructed. Because on everything that was constructed was done with that lens. And that's what Sound Trend is doing now and the community is doing now is making sure that we have a chance to take a breath and get it right and inclusive and equitably. Right. Great right story there. That is. You know, it, it, it reminds me, Julie, of what you and I have talked about before, some of the hottest trends. But I think that the number one trend that is coming mm-hmm. out of the pandemic is a focus on customer service, customer experience, putting, you know, as Stephen Covey says in his seven habits of highly effective people begin with the end in mind. What is the end? The end is to help our passengers. And if the service we're providing or where we're going to put the rail is not going to help them, it's going to hurt them. Then what are we doing? I mean, what's your yeah. thoughts on that? It sounds like we already heard them. <laughs> you, you did. Yeah. But, and there are also some issues with going back and relooking about how we built some of our prior infrastructure. We have some infrastructure that was built light rail at grade with at grade crossings through communities. Now that it's in place, the question is, is it safe for the community? Do we have to go back and retrofit? So the Martin Luther King Boulevard, Rainier Valley is an at grade system. And there have been some near misses, a lot of near misses. And then there have been some incidents there. We need to go back and look at those crossing treatments and make sure that we have the right wayfinding, the right visual cues, the audio cues, and the right gate to keep people safe. That is a historically African-American and low-income community. And now they're being impacted by something that should be lifting them up. So it, it's not just about planning for the future, but looking back and saying maybe in areas where maybe we didn't get it right, how do we go back and get it right? And that is very much what I think the Puget Sound region is focused on is that high level of look at equity and reversing maybe some previous decisions that had unforeseen or maybe maybe they could have been foreseen, but the consequences that we're living with now. And we need to go back and make sure that the passengers and the community and the pedestrians and the cyclists that are interacting in this very integrated, interwoven, multimodal system where we have bikes and pedestrians, we have buses and we have Ubers and we have light rail, all of them in the same corridor, making sure that they're safe and that people are the focus, not the vehicles in the corridor. That's great. Uh, You know, you mentioned multimodal and I I had one question I do want to go back to uh, based on your your, um, personal experience uh, and your tweeting, if you will, of of uh, your commuting around uh, town. But before I do that, your reference to the multimodal uh, culture here in Seattle, it was an adjustment for me uh, as well, seeing how many bikes are around, to your point, the what we call the Seattle nice, right? Uh, where we are overly accommodative to all types of, of traffic. Uh, I have to remind myself when I travel uh, back east to New York, don't step into the street like that. Uh, you, might, uh, you might run into some problems here. Uh, so, so maybe I'll save that for a second question. But the, the first question I did want to ask you about as you're, um, experiencing traveling in about, uh, Seattle, uh, you know, the, I, I reflect on a couple of experiences personally. I've gone to several University of Washington football games, used public transit and it's those environments, which is much better experience than driving because traffic is really bad. So that's where I want to go. Traffic, uh, has changed a lot. It's gotten worse. I think we were, probably back to pre-pandemic levels of traffic, probably six months into the pandemic, and it's gotten worse mm-hmm. since then. Uh, so how do you think about uh, the ridership experience and your personal experience first couple of months and what you see happening over time as this capital investment uh, continues? 
when I first got here, they had a week without driving challenge, which I okay. believe all of the CEOs of the transit agencies in this region participated in. And by the way, there are quite a few. While Sound Transit might be the largest transit expansion of capital improvement in the country, King County Metro is a major operator of local bus and community transit to the north and Pierce Transit to the south and Everett and Kitsap. We have many, many transit providers in this region that are all kind of coming together. My experience is that having the Orchid card, the one regional card for all, which I love that name, is our, our fare pass. And you can tap it on almost everything that you use. When you have that card in your hand, it doesn't matter if you're getting on a bus or on the train, on the water taxi, on the light rail, you use that and it's basically to one system. And that to me is part of the user experience is making that bus to light rail, to water taxi, to train feel like one system. Now, when you're on it, it's not perfect. It's so much better than where I came from though. Don't want to diss any, any of the, the places where I worked for before because I love them passionately but they were transit poor in a lot of ways. They had a lot of lifeline service. They had a lot of service that was frequent, which would have been maybe 20 minutes. Um, mm-hmm. And then when the bus didn't show up, you were waiting for an hour for your next bus. There are a lot of, a lot of them didn't have the benches. So going from an environment that was transit poor to an environment that is transit rich is eye opening. I can go to my bus stop and if I miss my bus, and sometimes I do, I watch it drive by. I know the next one's coming in six minutes, sometimes two. It makes all the difference in the world when you're using transit, when you know the frequency is there to get you where you need to go. And that has made all the difference to me, being able to transfer myself from a car-only mobility person to a transit-only mobility person. Now, once you're in the experience and you and I, you get over the happy glow, because there's a little bit of a happy glow, like, this is like the best ever. And you start seeing some of the reality. There's some trash. There are some people who are unsheltered. There's definitely some drug use. Those are things that we saw on other parts of the country because whatever's going on in our society is reflected in our transit system. It's, it's, I have faced those and it is uncomfortable. Uh, for some people who have a lower tolerance for that, it might even feel unsafe. I haven't never felt unsafe. But I'm seeing some do. And um, and we have social issues that we need to partner with to address. We need to address getting more affordable housing. We need to address more emotional and mental crisis support. And we need those on our streets as well as on our system. So I kind of went a little bit further than you asked, but I love the system. I love the multimodal nature of it. I've had amazing experiences with the operators here, but I've also seen that we have some social challenges on our system that we need to address. Well, no, thank you for that that uh, a thorough response because you effectively answered my second question that I was going to ask anyway. So thank you for that. Thanks, Rod. Julie, one last question I'm going to ask um, is for you to kind of lift your eyes to the hills from your perspective now, having served on both sides of the country and kind of speaking for what's happening across our industry as we now head into 2023. What do you see as two or three of the bright lights on the horizon for public transit? I do see this as a time where we're seeing a, I would hope, an existential change and defining who and what transit is and who we serve. For so long, I have been frustrated that the industry has felt that the, a strong need to focus on infrastructure, light rail, and the commuter workforce. And the idea is that when you put that money into the, computer, the commuter workforce, that it will trickle over into the rest of the ridership. It'll trickle over into the bus. It'll trickle over the, into the local service. And sometimes it doesn't, and frequently it doesn't. I think that when we went through this past, someone reminded me recently, it's been almost three years. I keep saying two years, but really we're almost at the three-year mark with COVID and with everything that the world has changed the past three years. This is a time where the, the entire nation has seen that transit isn't just about the commuter. The essential workforce kept us going. And now is the time to lean into that, where someone said, well, if the, if the commuters have left transit, why are we paying for it anymore? Because it is critical to the welfare of our societies, the health of our societies, of our people, to be able to have a multimodal network where they can use a car or a bus or a light rail or a bike or the sidewalk to get to food and housing 
and jobs. And they're not standing for an hour waiting for it in the ring. And this is the time where we're starting to look at national funding and infrastructure to really make sure we're leaning into that, that we're not just building more light rail. I say that and I know I'm, it's sound transit and I'm going to be asking for more money for light rail. <laughs> but it's interconnected, integrally interconnected with the bus network and with the bike pass and with the pedestrian and with affordable housing. We're putting a significant investment in affordable housing infrastructure around our light rail. And doing these and leaning into these initiatives is where we need to be going as a society and as transit. We need to get out of our lanes. We need to be looking at all the lanes. And we need to be pushing into how to make sure people have not just a nine to five commute, but they have mobility options throughout the day for all the resources they need. And I think with the, the funding that's going into transit and with this new idea that transit can be for everyone, that's where we as an industry need to lean into. Julie, you always inspire me. What a great way to close out this interview, talking about what transit can be, that we really are more than what we've been in the past. Thank you. It's, it's, it's an inspiring time to, to be in this position. And, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Rod, thanks also for co-hosting today. How did it feel? I feel great. Uh, you know, ans- asking questions versus answering them is always a, a different experience there, Paul. <laughs> That's great. Well, this has been a great look kind of at what's happening uh, in your region, but also in our industry as a whole, especially in North America. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today in our look back for 2022 and what we're looking forward to in 2023. Thank you for listening to part two of this special transit unplugged in-depth year in review and look ahead episode with our guest julie tim and now for part three where paul and rod talk about Medoxo as a company its philosophy of acquisitions and innovations and some of the big changes we've seen over this year at Medoxo, and then a look ahead at what transit technology in 2023 will be like Rod, in your role as a portfolio leader and head of Medaxo Americas, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Medaxo itself, the company itself, and and how it's uh, divided across the world and what your role here is in the Americas. Well, great. Thanks, uh, Paul. And I'd say first that uh, we're really, at its core, we're in the people mobility uh, business. Uh, obviously, trans public transit uh, agencies and, uh, and ancillary services are part of our core. Uh, we're focused heavily and primarily on on software supporting those those end markets. Now we operate, uh, as you alluded to, uh, globally. Uh, we we have approaching almost twenty five hundred team members across many businesses, uh, almost forty offices operating in thirty five plus uh, countries um, and almost twenty brands. Uh, and and uh, I say that uh, because that number is changing real time. Uh, right. We're, we're highly acquisitive. Uh, we're uh, very aggressive in, in the way we grow the business. So uh, so those numbers have to be updated on a fairly regular basis. Uh, now, I'm responsible for the America's portion of that uh, view. So which would include uh, Canada, uh, U.S., Mexico, Latin America and South America. Uh, we've got a strong presence in the U.S. That's where our origins uh, are with the trapeze uh, software brand. But we've also expanded as far uh, south as uh, Brazil, where we have multiple businesses uh, operating in that uh, in that region. Um, roughly half of the global employees are within the Americas uh, space, and uh, we've got uh, uh, twelve discrete uh, businesses, depending on how you count them, uh, within that and uh, and growing. Uh, and this year alone, we added uh, three uh, new uh, new organizations uh, to our uh, portfolio in the Americas. That's great. You mentioned Trapeze, which was kind of the base organization. Uh, that's who I worked for for the last four or five years. And then earlier this year, we made a change where uh, my functions with the company and that of the um, the products that I work to create, this podcast, the TV show, and other events we have, was kind of uh, elevated from Trapeze and moved to Modaxo, uh, mm-hmm. Modaxo Americas. Tell us about that. And you know, when people see uh, on the podcast now, you know, brought to you by Modaxo. How is that different than brought to you by Trapeze? And and why did you choose to go ahead and make those changes this year? Yeah, I think that's a great question, uh, Paul. I think it was perhaps, you know, uh, long overdue, to be fair. Uh, as I alluded to a moment ago here, we're doing, we're going uh, pretty aggressively. We're going in the Americas, growing in Canada and the U.S. with acquisitions and organically. 
And we've added, uh, you know, new um, uh, businesses to our portfolio in, in Latin America and South America. So because of that, uh, I thought that it was appropriate time for us to kind of take a step back and have a more list, more holistic uh, conversation about our portfolio of businesses. Trapeze, obviously, still a large part of that narrative, uh, but it made sense for us to start to include some of these other businesses uh, into the fold, into the conversation. Uh, I think I'd also say um, here that uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, that many of the companies that we were looking at, I'll speak specifically to Translo uh, as an example, they were doing their own thought leadership activities as well. And so we said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're all these different businesses that are doing their own thing. It probably makes sense for us to bring it under one umbrella uh, and, um, and, and get a little bit more of a broader conversation. And probably another way to say this here is, a term that's overused. So we just wanted a bigger tent, right? I uh, wanted to invite more people to the party. And we thought that that enhanced our conversation when we talked that way. That's great. And why don't we talk more about that? I mean, uh, one of the companies that you did acquire this year was Transloc from Ford Motor mm-hmm. Company, but you also acquired another really big name in the industry. Uh, yes, Route Match. Uh, Route Match is uh, a business that we followed for, for many years. Uh, and more recently, a little over two years ago, Uber acquired them. And then, uh, you know, earlier in this, in this, uh, year, this I'm not saying anything that's not publicly known. Uh, Uber decided to, uh, to go a different direction strategically and, uh, gave an opportunity for us to, to buy the, uh, buy the business as well. Uh, but once again, long, long history there, long, uh, familiarity with the product offering and, and what they do in the marketplace. We felt like it was a, a nice, uh, complement, uh, to our portfolio, particularly. For the mid-sized uh, transit agencies that we serve in the Americas, and is that why that you folded them into the TripSpark brand? It, exactly. I think there were a couple uh, things. There was the uh, go-to-market aspect of it, where we were it was a better fit with TripSpark, um, uh, leveraging the TripSpark leadership team, tr- uh, leveraging our commercial organization. I, I think there's also a innovation aspect to it, where there were some opportunities we saw for improving customer support, improving. Uh, the product roadmap uh, and enhancing some things that we we felt uh, could be um, solved in a better way. So rather than it being a standalone business within our portfolio, which is generally how we most often do acquisitions, uh, in this particular case, it made sense to to integrate it into to the TripSpark business and and leverage the work that had been done by that team. Well, you're uh, you're guiding me to my next question with the mention yeah. of Trapeze, which is, yeah. so on one company, you're bringing another company to it, but with Trapeze, the company had gotten pretty big again, even with the split off of Vontis a couple of years ago. So tell us about the latest news with the Trapeze brand. Yeah. I, you know, and so it's, it's an interesting dichotomy, right? Uh, all happening and, you know, for the most part in the same, same time. So while we were doing the acquisitions uh, for the other businesses, uh, Tripspark, as we were just talking about, uh, we were going the other direction with Trapeze. Uh, splitting the business into four distinct uh, uh, businesses. Uh, and essentially, probably the b- best way to, to say this is first and foremost, we wanted to do this to better serve the customers, right? We, 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 we talked earlier about how, how much change has been introduced into the environment, how fast things are changing, all the challenges that our, our customers are wrestling with from labor shortages to changing um, uh, conditions that were kind of, kind of created or disrupted by COVID, uh, we felt that we needed to respond to those customers more quickly. Uh, and the way we were organized under one uh, large trapeze uh, organizational structure, that, you know, heavily matrix that, uh, uh, mind you, uh, didn't make the most sense for our customers. So that was the that was the probably the, the burning platform for for change. I think by doing that, uh, creating these four uh, discrete businesses, so we essentially split. We've got mobility on demand, mobility planning and scheduling, uh, enterprise asset management, and workforce management. So those are the four groups that were previously product groups within Trapeze that are now standalone uh, business units. Uh, And each of them are now enabled to uh, work independently and collectively. Uh, But most importantly, uh, more intimately with the customers, uh, in a way that uh, allows them to innovate real time. That's great. 
You know, we don't often talk about trapeze or Medaxo on the show, almost never, actually. This may be the first time I've ever done this, an interview with one of our leaders. But I felt like for our listeners, it was important to understand what was happening behind the scenes because they did see a change from trapeze to Medaxo. And I wanted them to see how the interplay of all of them Mm -hmm. and where we're going. So last question, I guess, Rod, is as we head into 2023, what do you see for the future of the company? Well, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, want, I don't want to say more of the same because 2022 was so different from the prior <laughs> years. I, I, I first and foremost say that, you know, when I, I was reflecting on kind of some of our accomplishments for this year, obviously the acquisitions were part of it. Um, and, and of course, the what I just talked about with Trapeze was another uh, piece where it was literally, you know, surgery, open heart surgery. When you start mm-hmm. thinking about taking an organization and splitting it apart and trying to put it back together in a way that better serves the customer. So there's a lot of great things that we got accomplished this year that I, I expect more of that uh, in 2023. But one basic thing that I'm thankful for uh, this year that I think we have taken for granted over the last few years, as you think about it, really weren't going to trade shows in, in, uh, for, until the, for the first time for, in this year, right? right. And, and uh, you know, while I, I love the productivity of uh, video conferences, uh, seeing people in person is nothing quite like that, right? And so being able to get back together and try to, you know, grab a little bit of normalcy uh, that, that that was taken away from us, you know, during COVID uh, was exciting. And so being able to get out and, and interact with our customers, interact with each other more in 2023 is, is, is certainly what I look forward to. Uh, I also look forward to continuing to invest in innovation, as I alluded uh, a lot changed during COVID, and I expect more of that change. It will not go back to the way it was before. I think that part is is pretty clear. We've got a lot of you know headwinds that we have to navigate between leverage, labor shortages to inflation and all those other things. And and where those challenges exist, there's opportunities. And for those who can innovate and adapt the most quickly uh, and the most effectively, those will be the winners, right? And so, hence, that's the other argument, by the way, for doing what we did with with trapeze. Uh, and then I'd say last but not least, in addition to the, this organic opportunity in terms of innovation, investing in, in new products and the like, we also have the opportunity to invest in new acquisitions. And so I expect uh, next year to be as busy, if not more, uh, than, than we were uh, in 2022. That's awesome. Well, thanks, Rod. Thanks for being with us today and kind of sharing with us, maybe pulling back the curtain a little bit uh, yeah. behind the folks who are behind our podcast. And thank you for the opportunity to continue to do what I love to do, which is spread the gospel of transit. No, oh, well, thank you so much, Paul, for inviting me. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Transit Unplugged with our look back at 2022 and a look ahead at 2023. I'd like to thank our special guests, Rod Jones, Mohammed Mazgani, Jeremy Yap, and Julie Tim. To kick off our first episode of 2023, we have Jim Derwinski, CEO of Metra Commuter Rail in Chicago. Now, don't forget to go to transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with whatever is going on in the show. And if you have a question, comment, or want to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy and have a happy new year. Hi, this is Mike Bismeyer, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and of Mike's Minute from the Transit Unplugged podcast. I wanted to take a quick opportunity to wish you and yours a safe, happy, and wonderful holiday season. Regardless of how you celebrate, I hope you get some time to connect with family and friends, relax, and maybe revisit some of those old family traditions. Thanks for all you do for transit, and remember, If it presents itself, please take an opportunity to do something for someone a little less fortunate this time of year. Kindness is cool. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to talking to you in 2023.